Okay, I just wanted to point out that uh, he mentioned um, that Jonathan uh, uh, worked with Martin Scorsese. Um, some of the movies that Jonathan was producer on was Mean Streets, The Last Waltz, one of the great music documentaries ever at the end of the band, Vim Vendors, Until the End of the World. So, major stuff. Um, he also uh, wrote and produced the enhanced book, Outlaw Blues, Adventures in the Counterculture, which is, for any of you who've worked with enhanced books, ebooks on an iPad, it's one that really took advantage of the medium. So, Jonathan, when I interview folks, I like the audiences to get a feel for the people besides the work and the ideas we're going to focus on. So, uh, he and I both mentioned some of the highlights, but how do you look at your path to the work you do today and what you've come through? Uh, well, you know, I, I got out of Princeton, well, actually, go back a little bit. I, I think I would ju I've just been extraordinarily lucky. Uh, I happened to be at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965. As did I. Uh, and was introduced to Albert Grossman, who was Bob Dylan's manager, Peter Paul and Mary's manager, the Jim Quest and Jug Band, Odetta, you know, most of the important folk people. And the Question Jug Band needed somebody to schlep their gear around the festival for the weekend, and so I took the job. And um, it just so happened that Bob decided to go electric that weekend <laughs> and caused an incredible uh, stir in the music industry. Because, of course, the folkies thought it, it was apostasy that he was playing rock and roll on the stage of the Newport Folk Festival, and they booed him. And, but I got pulled into this Albert Grossman nexus, and I started working on the weekends at college for the jug band, and then eventually uh, for the band, who had been Dylan's backup group. And so that led to quite a few years touring. And then uh, I met George Harrison through Dylan and the band. And then he asked me to produce the concert for Bangladesh. And so I did that. And then most of the groups that I liked working with stopped touring for various reasons in the early 70s. And um, so I didn't really want to work for Alice Cooper, who was the big uh, touring band in 1973. So I came out here, and uh, a guy named Jay Cox, who was a writer for Time Magazine, said, well, there's this kid out there named Marty Scorsese who edited Woodstock, and he loves rock and roll, so you should meet him. So I said, great. And then I met Marty, and Marty said, well, I have this script that I'd love to do, it was called Season of the Witch, and I was so naive, I didn't realize you weren't supposed to put your own money into making movies. You were supposed to use other people's money. But uh, I did, I got my money and a friend's money, and we made Mean Streets for like $450,000. And it turned out really well, and we sold it to Warner Brothers. And so then I was a movie producer, so then we did the Last Waltz, and then I did To Die For, and Under Fire, and a bunch of other movies, and I just kept making movies. And then in the 1980s, I was working as an independent producer at Walt Disney, and the president of Walt Disney, named Ron Miller, who was there only because he was married to Walt's daughter, um, used to play poker for two hours every afternoon outside the executive dining room. And it was just such a symbol of, like, this company, Walt Disney, has gone to sleep. And I was so pissed off, I went down to see some friends in Texas named the Bass Brothers. And I said, this company is like a, a gem, but it's just gone to sleep. And Sid Bass said, well, that's great, but we own 9.9% .9 of Texaco, and we may have to go up to 25 
percent, and that will be another two billion dollars. So we can't make any other investments right now. So I went back to California, and then like three months later, Mike Milken, I noticed you have the Milken Institute, and Saul Steinberg started a raid on Walt Disney, and they freaked out. And then two weeks later, the Bass Brothers said, "Well, we just sold all our Texaco stock. We can save the mouse." So I put Walt Disney chairman together with the Bass Brothers and we made this amazing deal and they, the Bass Brothers paid me an investment banking fee, which was ridiculously big. <laughs> I mean, I made more money in four weeks than I've made in four years, you know, and then they asked me to go to work for their investment banker, which was Merrill Lynch, uh, Mergers and Acquisition Group. So I thought, well, okay, I'll try that. And then I did that for about four years, and I didn't really like it. Uh, we did a big deal with Viacom that was quite famous, but I, it was, I found it kind of soul-killing, and I missed the creative part. And then Vim Vendors called me and said, I have this crazy idea to do a science fiction art movie called Until the End of the World. And it's in five continents, 20 countries, and I thought, okay, I'll join the French Foreign Legion. I'll go with them. Uh, and it was one of the great adventures of my life. So I guess that's a long way of saying, I've just been lucky to be at the right place at the right time and not be afraid to change. So that's where this ends up, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just tell them just a tad about Outlaw Blues because it's under the radar and I think, and yet it's something yeah, worth, I mean, worth doing and worth seeing. Outlaw Blues was just an experiment. I was at the Innovation Lab and we were trying to figure out how you could make an enhanced ebook. So it's a, it's a book with 110 embedded videos into it. The problem with it, quite honestly, is that the file size is 480 megabytes. So for a company like Amazon, they would charge so much money for you to download that file that it was, it was not reasonable. Apple took it on just as an experiment. Sort of a demo for what you could yeah, do on iPad. Yeah, and, and so I would say it was more an experimental thing. You know, and it's a kind of a history of rock and roll and rebellion, um, and, but with a lot of cool video. You know, yeah. Jimi Hendrix setting his guitar on, on fire. You know, just a lot of places that I happen to be in the right place at the right time. Very good. So, um, this book, I, I mentioned to Jonathan before we started that I had heard about it for at least the last year and had been looking forward to it. How did, this is, other than Outlaw Blues, which as you say was an experiment, this is your first book. How did this book happen and why this book? So, I began thinking about what the internet had done to the artists that I cared about and their the ability to make a living. Uh, the drummer in the band was a guy named Levon Helm. And those of you who remember the band, they did great songs like The Wade and Up on Cripple Creek, and I did all the Dixie Down. And, and these songs were made in a period from about 1968 to 1978. And then they did, we did the last waltz in 1978, and the band stopped working. It's working. But because of the nature of the record business, everybody kept making a living from those old recordings because in the 80s, the CD came in and then everybody renewed their record collection and bought all those old records that they had on disc, they bought them on CD, so the band kept making a really good living. And in the year 2000, Levon Helm, who was the drummer, got throat cancer. And it also happened in the year 2000 that Napster arrived on the scene. And Napster was a pirate music site which put every song in the world out for free. And the royalties for the band just stopped. I mean, it literally came to an end. And this was just at this point when Levon desperately needed money for help there. And it wasn't. And so a group of musicians in Woodstock, led by Larry Campbell, kind of gathered around him and started a series of house shows in his barn <coughs> called the Midnight Rambles. And they managed to make enough money to just keep his health 
insurance paid for. So this seemed extraordinarily unfair to me that this had happened. So I began to research how this had come about. And, and really, ultimately, it came back to the fact that the whole nature of the internet had changed. That the internet had started at this very countercultural project, which those of us with gray hair can remember that in 1968, media consisted of three television networks and a newspaper. That was your media. And so, of course, the old idea that we should create this decentralized system of media distribution was a great idea. But by the late 1980s, a bunch of guys came out of Stanford, Peter Thiel being the leader of them, and Larry Page eventually, and then up in Washington, Jeff Bezos. And they all were trained in kind of Ayn Rand libertarian thinking. Can, can we pull this apart just a little bit more? Yeah. Just a little bit more about, because people who look at the internet today, and especially those who have only looked at it for the last 10 years or so, would never imagine those early origins. So just a little bit more yeah. about the, the okay. well and the, the, okay. the, so, the vision. So think of the people that, that were really the early progenitors. First off, the scientists, Ben Cerf, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, these guys contributed all the protocols for the web for free to a project that was paid for by the Defense Department called the DARPANET. So it was government funded. The scientists gave everything for free. Nobody had any patents, nothing. Secondly, Stuart Brand, for instance, who had the whole Earth catalog, which again, the gray hair, if you remember this great. <laughs> thing. So he started the whole earth electronic link called the Well. And it was just a online, basically a chat room that all these hippies could talk to each other. Using what was very primitive technology. Incredible. 28, 28 phone lines and 28.8 kilobits per second modems, you know. Um, so it was really, you know, Nick Negroponte said the whole idea was to decentralize things and harmonize people. So it had a very idealistic concept. But Thiel's notion was very different, which was that the internet was designed in a winner-takes-all way. In other words, scale was everything. There's a famous law called Metcalfe's Law which says the value of a network is worth the square of the number of users. So any exponential equation like that means you've got to get big really fast. So Larry Page understood that. Peter Thiel understood that, that there would be only certain winners in each sector. So in online payments, Thiel's company PayPal became the leader and still is Obviously, Google became the leader and the, the, the winner in search. Thiel then took his profits from PayPal and invested in Facebook. And Facebook, again, became the leader in social networks. And in his own orbit, Bezos at Amazon understood that if he got there first, he would win. And big thing was that the libertarians believed that the internet should be a space where there were no regulations, no taxes, no copyright, and no competition. So no regulations, totally open space, anybody can do anything they want. In other words, they led by the Ayn Rand motto, who's going to stop me? Uh, and Uber does the same thing, and you know, it's, it's, that's the way. You push the boundaries, you go right. a little outside the law. Yeah, you just keep going until you cause total outrage, <laughs> right? So secondly, no taxes. So Jeff Bezos was able to undersell every single independent bookstore by 5% because he wasn't paying 8% sales taxes on his books, and he could, he put about 2,800 
bookstores out of business. And you even say he chose Washington because uh, he knew most of his people, most of his customers would be elsewhere. Right. Um, third, no copyright. So YouTube is totally based on the point that a musician or a filmmaker has no rights to stop YouTube from putting their content up. And even though YouTube gets about 250 million takedown notices a year, 250 million. Now a takedown notice is someone noticed that my copyrighted work is being given away without copyright and I let them know. I let them know, they take it down, and the next day it goes right back up under someone else's thing. Because we, YouTube, don't control any of this stuff. We have no control, so it's not us putting it up. Totally fallacious idea. You notice there's no pornography on YouTube. They completely filter that out. And nobody can post pornography on YouTube. But they can post anyone's music, or they can post ISIS beheading videos. Now, it's only when advertisers in the last eight weeks begin to notice that their ads were on the front of ISIS beheading And, and we'll, we'll show a slide of one of those yeah, when we get to the slides. That, that, they, that they freaked out, and now maybe they're trying to change a little bit. But this is a, this is a business which is run based on the idea that there's 400 new videos uploaded every minute of every hour of every day every week and they will all be ways to suck in your data so I can sell you advertising based on who I know you are, where you are, you know, and now of course I'm going to put little speakers in your house so I can listen to you all the time there and if you happen to mention to your husband, uh, you know, the diapers and that word, that keyword goes in and bang, next thing you know Amazon is suggesting diapers to you and you know or Google is did you see yesterday's thing where Amazon is offering a new service that if you put their smart camera in where you're dressing they will give you design they will give you feedback on what you're putting on as to whether it's your best look like you want that <laughs> in your bedroom okay so last week at the Facebook conference Mark Zuckerberg said within four years we will be able to read your thoughts. Now his thesis was, you will be able to type by just thinking something. You know, you'll be able to send a message just by thinking it. But of course the inverse is, not only could I read your thoughts, but I probably could put some thoughts in your head like, ooh, hamburger <laughs> right around the corner, you know. Donut. Starbucks, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you know, so, I mean, this, all these tech, just go both ways. And so, you know, my thesis is these guys are what I call techno determinants. They believe they're the smartest cats in the room and they know where the world should go. And for the last 20 years, nobody has said anything to stop them. They said, oh, they're all geniuses. And of course we should do this. And even smart guys like Obama essentially went along with anything that Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google, suggested. So Eric Schmidt said, oh, here's a guy, to, a woman to run the patent office for you. Well, where did she come from? Google. Oh, here's a woman to be the assistant attorney general for antitrust. Oh, where did she come from? Oh, she was Google's attorney, uh, you, know, pat, you know, antitrust attorney. Here's someone to run the CTO of, of the whole government. And the most frequent guest to the White House. It was Eric Schmidt by Eric a factor Schmidt, of most 20. Fake, the most frequent guest to the Obama White House. Right. Now, we're going to get to some slides of the dominoes right. of the problem and so on, but before we do, the thing that I, I couldn't quite find an answer to in there is the influence of Ayn Rand and the Libertarians, as you've mentioned. So he's mentioned some people. They ended up. Have you tried to figure out what came first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, was the, were these guys geniuses? Was it a coincidence? Or it, did it help if you were a libertarian? Because then you played by different rules? Why? Well, you know, the libertarian credo is, you know, if you've unfortunately read some of Ayn Rand's <laughs> novels, which to me are horrible, but I did force myself in writing this book to wade through one of them. Um, the, the whole idea is 
There are geniuses, but the mob is full of idiots. And they will only stop the geniuses from doing what they want. And so we have to somehow get around the mob. In one of her books, all the geniuses go on strike and say, we won't do anything until the mob goes away or something. You know, so Thiel calls it the demos. Uh, but he, he openly confesses that capitalism and democracy are not compatible. First thing he says is the worst thing we ever did was give women the vote uh, in the 20s. He said that really screwed us up, especially for us libertarians, because women are too sympathetic and they, they will vote. Uh, and, and second thing, he says that you know capitalism and democracy are not compatible, and so capitalism has to rule and democracy somehow has to be suppressed. That's Honestly, why they love Trump, because they think a more authoritarian ruler will somehow make things easier for the capitalists. And, you know, clearly, he's trying. He's, they're going to eliminate any regulation on business. On, they're going to kill the EPA. They're going to do all the things necessary to make sure that there's nobody going to regulate the businessman. And, yeah. you know, the Koch brothers are thrilled. What about um, Jobs and Zuckerberg? Are they libertarian? I mean, okay, so, the so late Jobs, Jobs was not a libertarian at all. In fact, Jobs was a communitarian. And, and he, to me, is a hero. First off, Apple is not a monopoly. It is an incredibly competitive business with Samsung, Huawei, lots of other device makers. And most of Apple's business is in the hardware business. So. I'm not including him in the problem. And from a point of view of the creative community, which we'll get to, Apple has been the hero. In other words, if you were a musician that had a very popular song and you could get a million downloads on iTunes, you could make $900,000, you or your record company, right? If you have a million streams on YouTube, you can make $900,000. So it's a thousand times more on Apple as on YouTube. Or Spotify and, or and, and needless to say, a million streams is a very popular song. And yet it wouldn't pay half your rent in Silver Lake, you know, or Echo Park. I mean it, it wouldn't even, you know, it would get you a couple of meals. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this is insane and, and these companies are just taking advantage. And Zuckerberg, where does he fit in? So Zuckerberg, to me, is the most interesting character in the book. Obviously, he was early under the sway of Peter Thiel, who was his first big investor. Uh, and he went along a lot of ways with Peter Thiel. But I think he has reservations. And I, I make the analog to when Bill Gates got married <laughs> to Melinda, something changed. Some switch went off, and she said, you have to give away all your money. <laughs> and he did. <laughs> and he became one of the great philanthropists in the world. So when Zuckerberg got married and had a baby, his wife said the same thing to him. You have to give away all your money. Now, the way he did it was a little weird. He created this business foundation. Right. And needless to say, all of the worth of the foundation is Facebook stock. So it puts a contradiction for him, right? He has to make sure that Facebook stays the dominant social network, even while he is supposedly spreading connectivity to the third world or doing other yeah. wonderful things. Thiel did get there first <laughs> yeah. in terms of influencing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, I yeah. mean, we'll see what happens. I mean, at least Zuckerberg, although half of it seems PR, like he's, he went on a listening tour. He said he would go visit all 50 states this year. You know, so there's pictures of him in Alabama eating barbecue. And I think... <laughs> 90% of his publicity because, you know, he's having problems when P. 
people kill each other on Facebook live, you know, that could be a little <laughs> disturbing for some people. And so he has to counter that, you know. Yeah. So let's go to the slides. You've got a few powerful slides that offer a picture of what's going on in terms of the dominance um, and a few these few corporations right. in particular. So so I said, you know, the note Teal in, in the late 80s said, Silicon Valley will come to rule the economy. And that was a pretty bold statement in 1989. So 10 years ago, ExxonMobil, General Electric, Citigroup, Microsoft, BP were the largest companies in the world. And last year, Apple, Google, known as Alphabet, Microsoft, Amazon, and now Facebook has moved up above ExxonMobil. So now, all the largest companies in the world are tech companies. And why is that? Well, tech companies have margins, net margins of 30%. So you think about Google as an advertising company. It has a net margin of 30%. Uh, CBS is an advertising company, right? It makes its money from advertising. It has net margins of 10%. So where's the difference? Well, CBS spends millions of dollars on programming, talent, people, all of that. Google spends nothing on that. Google is a free rider on top of other people's content. So that's the first problem. These firms are all totally globally dominant. So there's Facebook compared to every other social network. Up at the top at 88% is Google's market share of the search advertising business. And down there, that little red line is big. It's about 5%. Um, that's Amazon's share of the book business. Not just the online book business, the whole book business. And last year, 85, 85 cents of every new dollar spent online went to Google or Facebook. So that is monopoly. What did that do to the economy of musicians or journalists? So this is newspaper advertising revenues since Google went online, so it's about 78% fall. Uh, this is music revenues, even including Spotify and all the new things since Napster went online, so it's 72% decrease. Um, and of course, the reason this is, is that YouTube and Facebook and everybody operates on some, under something called the safe harbor law. Um, so that means that no musician or anybody else could sue them for posting content that they did not own, license, or do anything else. Was they have a total free ride to take everybody's everything and post it, and nobody can sue them. And this is the law? Yeah. And this law was this passed is, when? This was passed by, signed by Bill Clinton uh, two weeks before Google went public. Coincidence? I don't know. But uh, so Peter Thiel says competition is for losers. If you want to create and capture lasting value, you have to look to build a monopoly. And that's exactly what he did. So here is the revenue stream of Google, Facebook, and Amazon. You notice they go exactly the opposite direction of the revenues of all the creative communities. So is, um, in terms of this, this looks like they've got the, well, let me go back to one thing, which is that law, the safe harbor law, which is clearly crucial. In other words, a network plays something that's a TV, CBS right. plays something that's copyrighted without paying for it, they're in trouble immediately. Right. This, is, this is the way it's been done up until very recently. Hey, hey, if CBS aired a video of a beheading or, or someone killing somebody, they would have their license revoked in like five seconds. Yeah, you say one cuss word. <laughs> right. I mean, they would be out of business. Yeah. And yet, there, last year there were 44,000 ISIS videos on YouTube of killings, 
training so, video. So Jonathan, I remember, it, maybe it's 10 years, maybe it's 15 years ago, but I remember reading articles <laughs> about the naivete of Silicon Valley when it came to lobbying. There, there was a point where they were just doing it and thinking they were geniuses and it would happen on its own and they wised up. Um, right. What so, so Google spends more money lobbying and political contributions than even the defense contractors today. <laughs> um, they have more influence. I mean, there's a whole chapter in the book called Google's Regulatory Capture. And essentially, they have, as I noted before, they have basically placed their people in all the critical parts of the government. You will notice in the next two weeks, President Trump will announce the new head of the Federal Trade Commission. And my guarantee, it'll be one of two people, Maureen Olhausen or Sean Reyes, both of whom have been approved by Google, officially. You know, in other words, he will not be somebody that Google doesn't want, because the Federal Trade Commission is the agency that regulates their advertising business. It'll be somebody that they do want. And so uh, that's the, you know, that's what happens. That's and the way that's it works. That's where yeah. their, their money goes. Yeah. And, but I do remember when it was like, you, it, I, there were articles, Wall Street Journal, they're, they're finally gearing up. They're finally realizing lobbying is something. But when they do it, they do it. Yeah. Um, is all of this inevitable? Do you believe that artists can reclaim their audiences? And if so, how? And then we'll talk about the politics at the very end here. Well, two things need to happen. One of which is these companies, which as I say are the richest companies in the world, need to share of some of the money with the components that make up their services. So if you go and inquire what are the most searched categories on Google, all of them are entertainment, right? They're all celebrity, entertainment, music, all that. So you have to either learn that YouTube needs to share more of the run instead of paying $900 for a million streams. Maybe it's even $9,000. It might not be $900,000, but it's $9,000 or $90,000. You know, something that's reasonable. But you're saying that's what they must do. That's what What's they gonna need to do. What's going to push them to do it? OK. So the, what's going to push them to do is one of two things. Either we get rid of the safe harbor law, which then all of a sudden they have to go negotiate with musicians or everybody else in good faith in order to get their content on their service. That's the first thing. So then a musician would have some hand, as George in Seinfeld used to say, you have some way to have a negotiation. So but, that's the first thing. But the second, that's not going to happen in the next four years, is it? Maybe, if maybe not. If we see not. what just happened with net neutrality. You know, it, it's weird. I've been on a book tour, so I'm oh. in a lot of cities. And last week, I was in Nashville, and there was a very conservative woman named Marsha Blackburn who happens to represent Nashville. So she is actually open Whoa. to getting rid of the safe harbor. Now, that's probably because she has a constituency made up a lot of fairly rich musicians or even poor musicians who, who are incredibly interested in this <laughs> yes. situation. I also you know, met with a lot of senators in Washington last week, and they're open to it. Now, I don't, I don't know if it's going to, and, and you know, what we did is we gave, this was a little nefarious, we gave Marsha Blackburn some statistics on how much Donald Trump has book has been pirated, you know, how much money he lost to piracy. So maybe maybe we'll we'll make it personal to the president that this isn't a good thing. So safe harbor is the first thing, okay, however. So we that's can get the first there. thing. The second thing is antitrust. So this government and previous governments ever since the 1980s have had a very distorted notion of the role of the antitrust authorities 
in America. It doesn't escape anybody here that business is getting more and more concentrated in America. If you're a farmer, you have to deal with Monsanto. You cannot avoid, you have to license your seeds from Monsanto. You can't even own them. You just license them for a season from Monsanto. If you're an airline customer, why do you think United Airlines can treat their customers so bad? Because if you want to go from Midway in Chicago to Lexington, Kentucky, there's only one airline. So of course they can treat you like crap, you know? So, you know, there's four airlines, there used to be 10. There's, you know, three pharmacy companies in the whole country, there used to be 20. There, you know, every sector is, but it's in the tech sector that it's really concentrated. So, you know, we could think about antitrust because first off, these companies have all been built by acquisition. Google bought AdMob, Google bought YouTube, Google, Google bought DoubleClick. That's how they got big and that's how they got to dominate the advertising industry. Facebook bought Instagram, Facebook bought WhatsApp. You know, so that's how they got to be big. Uh, Amazon bought 100 companies but most notoriously, you know, they bought Twitch, they bought Alexa, they bought Zappos, they, you know, that, I mean, so these companies get big by acquisition. And one theory of antitrust, which Justice Brandeis put forward is, they should never get this big in the first place. Because his theory was, look, you, you, government tries to regulate a company, the regulator inevitably gets captured by the company. So just don't let them get big in the first place. So first thing I would say is they, couldn't, they should not be able to buy any more companies. Um, whether we break them up or not, that obviously is not gonna happen in the next four years, uh, but that's certainly a possibility. The other possibility that I raise is that in the 1950s, we had a monopoly phone company called at and and AT&T was forced by the regulators to invest a large portion of its profits in research and development. <coughs> so they created something called Bell Labs. And in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, Bell Labs invented the transistor, the laser, the solar cell, the cellular system, the satellite. Basically, every component of the digital age was invented at Bell Labs. And what the government did was say to Bell Labs, you have to license every one of these patents for free to any American firm in return for being a monopoly. It could be that Google is a natural monopoly. In other words, economists define a natural monopoly as a firm that can provide all the services that's needed cheaper than two firms could. And it could be that Google is that, that they're essentially a utility in the modern world. And if so, then maybe we should regulate them like we did regulate Bell Labs, which is we don't tell them how to run their business. We just make them license those thousands of patents they have for autonomous cars, for search algorithms, for advertising placement, for all that, make them license that to other firms. Because what happened in the 50s with Bell Labs was it created an explosion of new firms. Texas Instruments, Fairchild Semiconductor, Intel, Comsat, Motorola, all these firms came out of Bell Labs. And oftentimes entrepreneurs left Bell Labs to set up their own firms like Fairchild Semiconductor. I mean, so by the way, this was a part of the story I didn't know. And that to me is a fascinating, I mean, that it's been done, that there's precedent and that the president worked out quite well. Yeah, yeah, because quite honestly, this myth that this is incredibly great time to be a startup is nonsense. I mean, even look at an incredibly well capitalized startup like Snapchat. And look what happens. Snapchat introduces this feature stories. Three weeks later, Facebook knocks it off puts it on Instagram, puts it on WhatsApp, puts it everywhere, and, 
And they call it stories. They don't even bother to change the name of it. Yeah. I mean, Snapchat they, looks like R&D for Facebook. Yeah. And every time Snapchat comes up with a new feature, Facebook has it within two weeks. And so Snapchat goes public, and there's our goes down, 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 down. You know, Facebook will, I'm sure there are people at Facebook whose whole job is to be a Snapchat killer. You know, just you think about Snapchat 24 hours a day, and we're going to nail them. OK. Know? We only have a few minutes left yeah. before we go to questions. So let's switch to the second part of the title, which is Undermining Democracy. Right. How so? Now, obviously, we all have heard a lot about fake news and so on. But how, it, how is this concentration of power hurting the country? OK, so this is just one simple slide. So you probably remember that all last spring, Fox News and Breitbart were on Facebook because they claimed that the kids who ran the trending topics part of Facebook, which is the stuff that surfaces the most, were too liberal, and that they were advantaging liberal media over conservative media. So eventually, the noise was so much that Zuckerberg just gave in. And on May 23rd, he announced that they were going to take the humans out of the trending topics. In other words, they would just let the computer algorithm decide what was trending. So needless to say, Steve Bannon and Cambridge Analytica was just sitting, waiting for that moment to happen. And you see that red dot down there. That's May 23rd. And that's when fake news took off. Because what Bannon was able to do with the help of this analytics firm was take a post, a fake post, put it up, and then bomb it with bots. You, you all know what a bot is. It's a, an artificial piece of, it's a computer who pretends it's a person. And so it would get lots of likes, it would go up the stack, and it would go to the top of the trending topics. Uh, well, this, is, yeah. this is just, I remember I said, ads on top of ISIS videos. Here, so here's an ISIS video with a bounty paper towel. I, I, I love it that it's a Koch Brothers company. Yes. Um, so, so they were able to play that algorithm and make it, you know, make their stories go to the top. And they, they even did something that's even more nefarious. They would put out posts on Facebook I showed it to Terrence earlier. It's a, a little thing of a black kid behind bars, and it's Hillary saying, young black men are predators. Super predators. Super predators. And they sent it only to young black people. No white people ever saw that ad. And the whole idea was, we're going to suppress the vote. And they sent it, they, they targeted Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. Detroit, you know, all the places that made, you know, maybe 5,000 people would have made a difference. And it was very effective. Right, not to convince them to vote for Trump, but just to inhibit them yeah. from voting at all. Right. So, should we have questions? Yeah, yeah. So, let's go to, I turn it over to Ted. Who yeah, I'll bring the microphone to anyone who has questions. Just a quick reminder around here, questions start with a W or an H. Sometimes the Ds, they are typically short. Only Terrence asks, gets to ask follow-up questions, and we do not believe in two-part questions. <laughs> What's your view of net neutrality? Uh, I think the fact that the Trump administration is going to limit it, eliminate it, is horrible. Because, look, all it's going to do is give the monopolists more power, right? So, you might explain, what? in case anyone doesn't know what it means. Okay, explain. so net neutrality means that every stream should run at the same speed, load at the same speed. And so, what is the effect of this? Okay, so people with lots of money, like the NBA and YouTube, will be able to have their video play fast. And by the way, Verizon or AT&T or anybody will include 
the people who pay up in the data cap, you know, free data package, right? You won't, you won't be charged extra to watch this NDA game. But if you're a small startup, you won't be able to afford that. And your, your stuff will be outside of the data plan. So to watch a little movie on some small site will cost you five more dollars on your data plan. And it's, it's horrible. All it does is enable the monopolists to make more money. How do we create awareness among really young people about the implications of handing over their data just like willingly to companies like Google and Amazon? Because in K through 12 curricula, I see all sorts of stuff like, how do I write an email? How do I use Google Docs? But absolutely zero critical thinking. Right. So uh, I think this is the most important question. And you know, the general assumption has been that your generation doesn't care a bit about privacy, and so it doesn't care. And even Mark Zuckerberg goes so far to say, well, privacy is an old idea, and it's, it's not important. Um, I think you know, once you begin to understand, for instance, the implication of having an Alexa in your home, then maybe you might be a little freaked out. So last month, in Mississippi, a district attorney subpoenaed Amazon because there was an Alexa in a house where there was a domestic violence incident. And of course, Amazon pleaded First Amendment rights on the part of the owner of the device, but eventually it was forced to turn it over. And of course, the whole horrible domestic violence incident was recorded on Amazon's servers. Uh, you know, they say it's a smart speaker, but it's a smart microphone. And the microphone is always on, because what it's looking for is keywords that will then lead them to give you other advertising. And I'm sure you've all been creeped out by ads following you around everywhere you go, maybe even after you've bought the product. You know, the point is that all of this, we have to somehow build awareness that this is bad, and, and quite honestly, two other things that, that Snowden pointed to. It's much easier for the government to go to Google or Facebook and get data from billions of people than to try and break into individual phones. It's just simpler, and if they have all your data, where you've been, where you were walking, what, which is all there, then, you know, if, if there was an authoritarian regime, Big Brother is really simple to make happen, you know? And so maybe that kind of awareness m might be helpful too. But I agree, there is no critical thinking. There, there's a great line, I don't know whether we originated it or not, but it's that if the service is for free, you are the product. Yeah, totally. Right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it isn't that Google puts stuff out for you, it's that when you tune in, you are delivered to the advertiser. You, your eyeballs, your clicks are the product. So, just, just one quick thing. I was at a conference at the University of Chicago, which those of you who understand about economics know is the home of Milton Friedman and and the, the Chicago School is the Libertarian Economist. And by the end of the conference, which title was, Is There a Concentration Problem in America? Ooh. Even the most conservative economists had come to the conclusion that this new capitalism, which I call surveillance capitalism, because let's be clear, that's the business these people are in. They don't care a bit about content or movies or music. It's just a lure to get you to give them your data. And surveillance capitalism is different. And you, we essentially have three firms having data on in excess of two billion people. Deep, deep data. If I want to advertise to women in Nashville, Tennessee, who drive Ford trucks, drink bourbon, and listen to 
you know, Garth Brooks. I can do that. I can hit Jeff Stent. So and and who are who have been looking yesterday for yeah. a new dryer. Right. Right. What do you think of Google changing their corporate motto or mantra from "Don't be evil" to I think it's "Do the right thing," which might be a Spike Lee title, or maybe they just lifted that from Spike Lee. Is <laughs> is it possible for a corporation or monopoly to not be evil because they're serving their shareholders? Which question is what is the right thing for whom? Well, look, I mean, you could you could suggest that from the libertarian free market idea, they're just maximizing value for their shareholders and especially for their <laughs> owners. Because remember, in all these three companies, the people who are the leaders have 10 times the voting rights on their share of stock that you would if you bought a share of stock. Right, you get so to you, share in the power, but not in the decision. You will never be able to tell I mean, them share in the money, to, right. but not you the decision. Right, you get to share the money, but you don't get to share in any decision. So, uh, my feeling is that there is such a thing as corporate social responsibility. And these companies are spending millions on PR, it's just like that Mark Zuckerberg listening to her. You know, they're spending millions on PR, but, and clearly YouTube was embarrassed when Procter & Gamble said, we're not gonna put any more ads on YouTube as long as you have these beheading videos. So, they're gonna have to do something in response to the market. Uh, are they good at PR? They hire the best. They make these wonderful videos about falling in love because you had the Google search in Paris. And, I mean, they're just marvelous at it. So, I, look, I'm cynical. I, I studied at a communication and taught at a communication school. This has been going on forever. But at the end of the day, if you have 88% market share of a business, you're the dominant player. And if you use that dominance to crush rivals, to manipulate politicians, to do everything, it's no different than Standard Oil in 1906. I, I use the, the phrase, data is the new oil, right? And it is, man, and it's no different from Standard Oil having a monopoly on the oil business in, at the turn of the century. And let me just add that while that thing of you are the product was true for television as well, right? In other words, television, we thought it was delivering programming. No, it was delivering us to advertisers. But the interactivity and the surveillance is just right. a whole different right. ballgame. We have time for two more questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, great to see you, Jonathan. Uh, we've interacted. You've been always disruptor and, and leader of the thought. <laughs> Um, I, sorry I'm late, I made it from my development of California Space Center site. Quickly, uh, we spoke about uh, our media platform. Happy to report I harnessed international capital. Uh, ownership of the platform should go to the musicians if people who own the platform have a business model and intention to do that. I have it. Comment on it, please. Right. So. In the, in the final chapter, there's a whole section about cooperatives. And I, I totally believe that, you know, that, you know that's the future. Uh, you know, I, I point to the example of Magnum Photography Cooperative, or, or those who, of you who are in the hip hop genre, you know, odd future. In other words, groups of musicians or artists or photographers who came together and collectively said, okay, We'll sell our content to somebody, but the middleman doesn't take 50%, the middleman takes 10%. The cooperative takes 10%. And even Bandcamp uh, is, you know, only takes 10% out of the transactions as opposed to YouTube, which takes 50% for doing nothing. You know, so uh, that's, that's the idea. One more? Our final question. Um, so, do you feel that there's any market solution uh, in the event that Safe Harbor is not undone and there is not restriction put on M&A? 
So the problem with the market solution is just a, a thought issue, thinking about this. If I came to you and said, I want you to invest $500,000 along with a bunch of other people, I've got 10 friends, to, to create a startup to challenge Google in the search engine business. Would anybody here make that investment? <laughs> I doubt it. I wouldn't. I mean, I'd say you're, you're out of your mind. You know, it's just not possible. I mean, think of even Snapchat. I love these guys. They were idealistic in everything. But they had no idea what they were getting into. And when they refused to sell out to Facebook, then Facebook said, well, screw you, bro. And bang, they put the hammer down. So this is not, I mean, I, I cite a lot of examples of really good guys at MIT who say, it's so much better to be an incumbent than a startup right now. And this is something that's changed in 10 years. That was not the case 10 years ago. So I don't think there are market solutions. That's why Teddy Roosevelt, in 1906, felt the only solution to dealing with Standard Oil was a government. Because Standard Oil just was so good at crushing its rivals that there was no market solution. And I'm not positive there's a market solution here, either. So on that happy note. Thank you. <laughs>